Hello there, dear listeners, and welcome to another edition of Starry Skies, the magazine programme that tells you what you can see in the heavens above us this month, and the month is June. So I'm Mark Hardacre, but today Steve Tonkin, my usual companion on the show, is uh, sadly unable to join us. He's got a bit of an illness. So I'm joined today by Michael Barrett, another astronomer from uh, Falling Bridge Astronomers and a good friend. So welcome to the show, Michael. Welcome. I'm really pleased to be here, although obviously sorry that Steve uh, is indisposed at the moment. Yeah, well, it'll be better soon. Uh, mm. You've also been an astronomer for a long while, though, haven't you, Michael? Well, I have. I started astronomy, I think, when I was about nine. So a good few years, but we won't say quite how many. <laughs> And, you know, that's, that's another thing. That's, that's a good thing to encourage young astronomers. Um, I was also eight and nine when I started. Because they turn into old, grey-haired astronomers like me and you, don't they? Well, I'm not sure about the grey hairs, more the... Uh, more the, the bald. The, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't really start talking about June, can we, until we finish off with May. Uh, with what was the astronomical event of the century so far. And listeners, I don't know how many of you saw the fantastic display of Aurora Borealis uh, that uh, was all over the UK and even further south on the 10th of May. It was spectacular. Michael, did you see it? I certainly did. In fact, I was up in York, so I was a little bit closer to the Arctic Circle. I had a, mo a most amazing uh, uh, display up there, yeah. the, the pinks and the purples and the reds. Not so much the greens, but we got some lovely photographs, yeah. Uh, images. Yeah, it was really something special. You know, in all the years I've been an astronomer since 67, 68, I've never seen a display like that, have you? No, not at all. In fact, you know, as I say, I've been doing this for some some years now have always wanted to see something like this even been to Iceland and Greenland and never seen anything like what we saw the other night in the UK yeah it's it's truly spectacular and there's more to come we'll 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 talk about that a uh, little bit later on but uh, we think the there should be more sunspots to come um, and, and more activity on the sun, which causes the aurora. So well, we'll talk about that a little yeah, later Yeah, indeed. On. I was imaging the sun yesterday, and there's, it's quite spotty at the moment, which would indicate that, yes, we can perhaps expect some more displays a bit later on. So yeah. a spotty sun produces aurora. Is that more or Well, sort right? of. It's the electromagnetic field that's generated, e ejected from it. But usually when you see a, a lot of sunspot activity, you know the sun is is pretty well active and there is likely to be some electromagnetic storms brewing up on the sun so keep looking uh, download an app there's a lovely app called aurora uk aurora watch uh, UK, i think it's, it? yeah aurora, aurora watch, watch UK, uk i think it is download yes. that to yeah. your smartphones and it will alert you as to when the aurora are going to appear look to the north always in the north for what look like thin clouds but with your iphone or your your smartphone should i say um, you'll be able to image them and get nice reds and pinks and greens on your phone. Anyway, enough of June. Sorry, enough of May. Let's go to June, uh, the month of barbecues and sun cream. And uh, generally, it's a time when telescopes go to bed, isn't it? Because we don't get any uh, darkness in June. Not really, no. We, we, we tend to find that the... Well, I think you've got the details, um, but the sun sets around sort of quarter to ten and doesn't, and then rises again at sort of uh, four in the morning. So, yeah. And we don't really get any really proper dark skies at all, no. Yeah. In fact, the whole of June, we, we don't get any what's called astronomical twilight. That's when... The sun is 18 degrees below the horizon. Uh, we don't get any of that. And we don't get any proper darkness again till mid-July. Well, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you explained that, Mark, because <laughs> I get all the civil <coughs> twilight, nautical twilight, astronomical twilight. I should know the difference between these. It's all to do with the, uh, uh, the degrees below the horizon. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, for all the intents and purposes, it don't it get don't dark. It don't get dark. That's right. <laughs> So, not only is the sun and daylight a nuisance this month, but also the planets. Um, usually we have plenty to say about them during the, the month, but uh, this month, June, like May, uh, most, have been, most have been near the sun and therefore aren't visible at night at all. Mm -hmm. So, let's just go through one by one. 
Um, Mercury, which is the nearest to the sun, uh, always difficult to see at the best of times, it passes behind the sun in mid-June, making it very, very difficult to see it. Though we might just see it in the evening sky, is that right? Yes, just towards the end of the month. You might, for a few days just before the, the end, going into July, there is a possibility you'll see it. And it's always an exciting thing to see because it's such a difficult, elusive little planet to see. And some of the most famous astronomers in history claim never to have seen it. So do have a look. It's always worth. But always remember that if you are searching for Mercury with binoculars in and around the sun, just be careful. Yeah, be exceedingly sure careful. Yeah. Yes, yes. And the next planet out from Mercury is Venus, uh, much, much brighter normally. But like Mercury, has passed behind the sun on the 4th of June, so yesterday. Uh, so we can't see it when it's there and it's going to be quite a while before we get to see it again sometime um, around August time but it it did give us a tremendous display last year didn't it? Oh it's brilliant absolutely wonderful one of the best displays we've had and so you know it's distance from the apparent distance from the sun in the sky was quite remarkable yeah. and so it did hang around a, a long time. Yeah, yeah we saw it in the evening sky we during did. April and then the morning sky and it's been very very bright as, uh, as many of you will have seen. Then moving out of it, um, Jupiter is back in the morning sky, not at its best by any means, so you're going to have to get up at 3.30 in the morning. And those of you that drive up the A31 uh, facing east might just see it peaking above the horizon around 3.34 yeah. before it gets light. Uh, but you won't have to wait for too long. It's going to be spectacular in autumn and winter. Oh, it will be, yes. It'll be a great uh, winter planet. And, of course, it's climbing in the sky, so we're getting better and better uh, uh, views of it. Yeah, so yeah. more about Jupiter as uh, we get into the autumn time. And the same with Mars. Uh, Mars is trying its best right now to outrace the sun and is probably also best seen around 3.30, low in the eastern sky. But don't expect it to be a blazing red planet just yet. Uh, you'll have to wait again for autumn. Yes, I always find it slightly disappointing, yeah. particularly early on. It's a very quite a dim red star, um, not that remarkable. It's only when it comes to opposition, which is approximately every two years, that you actually do get that lovely bright. And, and of course, as the years progress, it's going to be its opposition. That's when it's the other side of the Earth to the Sun. Uh, it's uh, it, in its orbit. It's going to be a little bit further away. So yeah. not 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 the spectacular uh, apparition, as we astronomers call it, that's appearance uh, that it was in 2003. Yeah, that was that was a really spectacular yeah. one. Uh, we will have an opposition this year. I think it's towards December or something. Uh, when Mars will be very bright, and again we'll cover Mars in yeah. greater detail in a show uh, in the winter time, which leaves us with only Saturn, which uh, of course is the famous uh, ringed planet. Both of us saw that when we were kids. Oh, absolutely! And I think both of us would say that the wow moment of seeing the ring. Oh, the wow! Saturn, yes, yes, yeah. That, that is yeah. definitely what sets you off. So, if you ever get the chance to have a look at Saturn through a telescope with your son or daughter with you. It will set them on perhaps a, a trip of a lifetime to astronomy. It is a wow moment, isn't it? It is indeed. I mean, I've had people say, I, I, on one occasion, somebody said, that can't be real, can it? You must have stuck a picture of it on the end of your telescope. I couldn't believe it was real. <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 And, and we've had examples here in the New Forest where we've taken cubs and scouts and young people and, and counted the number of wows when they see Saturn. It really is a wow object. But not really yet this year again it doesn't even rise until two in the morning and it's not particularly bright one of the reasons it's not so bright is its rings are tilting and i understand its rings are going to be pretty close to edge well on yeah Earth. that's what's going to happen in, in its orbit uh, as seen from the earth it normally is quite uh, tilted the, the the globe of the of saturn is tilted so that the rings are tilted and so we see them in all their glory but it's actually uh, for, for want of a better word, it's settling in on itself so that it's going to be almost level. With, and the rings, people don't understand this, but the rings are only about a mile in, in yeah. depth. Yeah. 
So once they close up, what we say close up, you're not going to see them. That'll be next year, yeah. and for a short period of time, uh, you know, uh, Saturn will appear ringless, which will yeah. be a, a bit sad. But yeah. uh, so we'll, we'll have the globe and a very fine line. The fine globe, line, if, if, that's if where yeah, the, the rings yeah. are edge on. Yeah. Anyway, that's to come as well. And like with all these planets in this month of uh, June, you know, we're left a bit disappointed, but knowing that uh, come the autumn time, we're going to have a blaze of planets to, to see and to talk about. Okay, so moving right along, um, how do we find these planets and constellations in the sky? Well, of course, for old fuddy duddies like Michael, and <laughs> well, speak for yourself. Yeah, I'll I'll go, go. Go on. All right. um, we we still do like the astronomical magazine, don't we? Do you do you get a couple of magazines? I do actually. Yes, I mean, in 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 reality, I, we're joking aside. I do get uh, Sky at Night magazine, which is the the BBC. Am I allowed to say BBC on yes. Forest FM? Uh, there are other radio stations. Are other radio. Okay, fine. Yes, it, the BBC ra um, Sky at Night magazine. Uh, I'm also uh, involved with a, a organisation called the Society for Popular Astronomy, which used to be the Junior Astronomical Society, and their brilliant magazine, which I believe might have been by, is deputy edited by somebody who also appears on Forest FM from Could time be, to yeah, time. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah that's it. Um, but also, we, we use, you know, we are not that fuddy duddies. We are using modern technology such as an app called Stellarium, which is, is right. very good. Yeah. So we, we, we're, we're, we're using a combination, really, aren't we, of old fashioned magazines and paper uh, all the way through to the the, the top uh, one of the best applications you can put on your phone is Stellarium or Sky Guide is yes, another one yes. there are a number uh, all of which help you to point your tablet or your iPhone or smartphone at the sky and it will tell you um, what you're seeing up there you can point it to a bright star and discover its name or find out that it's actually a planet you can point it to the moon and so on so do download these. Um, you can find them in your in your uh, Google Store or yeah. your Apple Store. They're they're very good. I'm sure a lot of you have them. Yeah. Well, I, yes. I yes. Being a little bit of a fuddy duddy, though, I still think it's, it's whilst they're fun. It's a bit like like putting your you know your sat nav in your car and saying take me to I don't know Wigan or somewhere. You have no idea where Wigan is. It'll take you there. And I don't think there's anything quite like actually do learning the night sky and learning your way around with a good old fashioned atlas. And it's very true. And both of us from this this era, shall we say, learned to star hop, which means really getting out the star atlas, which is like the AA atlas book of the road, and going from village to village, or going from star to star, to pick your way to the next object you want to find in the sky. These modern telescopes have the equivalent, really, of a GPS or a satellite. Well, they are, yes. And that, press a button, yeah, it takes you right there. It does. It's called the go-to app, it. and, uh, yeah. and, I, and I use it. I do yeah, use of it. of course. Uh, principally for out outreach, actually, yeah. Mark, you know, so that it's easy and quick when you've got people who want to see things. Um, but I still believe, you know, and even today, I still use an A to Z occasionally when you know, things are not going too well on the roads, which seems to be happening a lot yep. uh, to find alternative routes and that. So, yeah. And the yeah. Star Atlas serves the Star same Atlas, purpose. same. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So talking of star atlases and, and constellations, what's our constellation of the month this month? Ophiuchus. Yes, well, Ophiuchus. Um, I'm going to have to leave this one to you, I think, Mark, because I, I have to say to you that uh, because I could never pronounce it or spell it, I, I didn't really do a lot of uh, observing of it. Uh, and also, back in, back in the day, as they say, um, it was my Patrick Moore Observer's Book of Astronomy, if everybody remembers the Observer's Books. Oh, right, he yes. said there was nothing at all of interest in it. Yes. But I think you... You, you, was, you he, can tell he, us otherwise, aren't you, He was quite wrong. Yeah. No, I think yeah. that um, Ophiuchus is... We normally, on this programme, we talk about... Um, relatively large, bright constellations that you can easily find. Ophiuchus is large, uh, but it isn't really quite bright, but it's full of some interesting objects. I think Patrick, when he wrote the Observer's Book in 66 or 7, uh, hadn't really got into the globular clusters no. that we'll talk about mm. in a minute. But Ophiuchus, what, what's it meant to rep represent? Well, it's meant, it, it's tightly, it's the serpent uh, bearer and has... Like snake? Like snake, yes, right, like snake, right. and 
you know, as you probably are aware, the snake is a symbol, snake and sword is a symbol of, of, of medicine and, and medic. So it goes back to the, you know, the ancient uh, um, he healing. Uh, oh, right. Healing, okay. yeah. I was unaware of that, I have to say. Yeah. Um, it's, and you can find Ophiuchus, again, look at our map uh, on the Forest FM website or uh, Falling Bridge Astronomers or Wessex. You'll find out the map of the constellation and it will be due south um mid sky i would say in the middle mm. of june uh and as michael said it's a me meant to be a man grasping a snake um which is on either side of him one side is the snake's head yes right? that's right and the other is its tail it's very unusual actually uh, that uh you know n normally the constellations in the night sky they're they're in one piece but on this occasion you've got the uh, constellation of serpents the snake in two bits serpent Cowder, or cowder, the Cowboy. serpent's head. Oh yeah. no, is that no the tail? That is, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And say, so, oh, well, you're 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 the Latin scholar. I got a thirty-seven percent at Latin. Come on, serpent's <laughs> caput was the head, That's and right, serpent's yes. corda. And in the middle, of course, uh, you've got Ophiuchus. So, although it's not a very particularly bright constellation, there are a number of interesting objects in there for your binoculars and small telescopes. Uh, have a look on the uh, on the website, as I said. Um, but one interesting fact about Ophiuchus is it actually lies on the zodiac. Mm. So it really should be a zodiac constellation. Now, the zodiac is, that's the path, right, that the sun and the moon and the planets Yes, through. yes. As you, as you probably have, have heard, the, the sun and the planets and most of the, uh, the moons of the planets, they all line on the same plane. So they appear to travel along a line in the sky. And the line through which the constellations uh, pass is called the ecliptic. And those constellations are called the zodiacal constellations, which are the ones that you will be familiar with in, in uh, you know, newspaper astrology. horoscopes and, yeah. and astrology, yes. That's right. But uh, Ophiuchus, strangely, um, is... Is, is, although it's on the zodiac, is not regarded as a zodiacal constellation. The sun passes through it from the 30th of November until the 18th of December every year, which is how many days? That's 18, that's 19 days that the sun is in Ophiuchus. While it's in Scorpius, the next uh, zodiacal constellation um, before it, only for mere five days. Mm. So Ophiuchus has got more right to be regarded as zodiacal constellation as Scorpius. Right? Yeah, well, I do wonder what happens if you were born in the, on those days. You know, what are you? What are, um, you? are you an Ophiuchian? Well, I would have thought so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't spell Ophiuchus, they're the Ophiuchian, <laughs> but there we go. Um, do they have a future, these people? I don't know. I, I mean, don't but know. anyway. But of course, we have to be careful not to mix up um, astronomy Absolutely. and astrology. Yeah, we're not astrologers. We're no. not astrologers. No. We're astronomers. Astronomy is a science, observation, checking, and testing uh, of the scientific method, while astrology is entirely bogus. There we go. Let's be controversial. This well, be controversial. But I will say one thing in favour of astrology. The ancient, uh, you know, the ancient Egyptians and the Chinese and that were astrologers, and they did provide an awful lot of observational uh, data from which we astronomers have learned such things as the periodic periods of comets and... Right. and, and uh, uh, supernovae and things like that. So they did have their use, but yeah. not telling the future. Not the future, future. No, absolutely. No. We, no, we don't agree. Anyway, <laughs> so um, Ophiuchus is the home to a number of so-called globular clusters. Have a look at the map, and you'll see those little yellow uh, dots on the map of Ophiuchus, and each one of those is a globular cluster. And Ophiuchus is very fortunate that it has quite a number of these objects. What is a? Can you explain to us what a globular cluster is, Michael? Oh, you know, I knew you'd ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Somebody has to answer it. Well, yeah, I suppose they do. Yeah, the globular cluster—they're the, the, interesting objects, actually. I, I described them. I've described them as sort of a bit leftovers from from our galaxy. They are actually—they're the, the, in a halo around our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So when you see one, you're actually looking outside of our home galaxy, which right. in itself is quite exciting, and. Being being, if I use the term leftovers, they're, they're very, very intense um, balls or spheres of old stars. Right. Um, they tend to be the more older, redder stars, um, which uh, 
they have the appearance, I suppose, of a bit of a glowing snowball, not to be confused with comets. But, right. but that's one of the reasons that Messier, which I think you're going to talk a bit about, yeah. our French astronomer friend Messier, he was quite anxious to um, discover or discover comets and not get, you know, get comets and these things confused. So right. that's why he did a catalogue of them. But uh, yeah, they're 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 intense, unlike. Open clusters like the Pleiades, uh, which the Seven Sisters, which people may be aware of, which are younger, newer ones. These are very old, and they're a long, long way away. Yeah. yeah. So, so in fact, um, to find them, you can find them in binoculars. Again, look at your maps, and uh, two of them, um, Messier Ten and Messier Twelve, you can easily find in binoculars. It looks like a grey, uh, fuzzy patch. Uh, but with a bigger telescope, as Michael said, it looks like an enormous football of glowing stars. Um, different colours, many different colours, mm. but mainly white to blue to uh, red in there as well. Um, and, and Charles Messier, our French friend, we've talked about him several times on this programme, has actually discovered how many of them in Ophiuchus? How many? Do oh, they... now you're asking yes, me again. So... You know, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I know I, I can think immediately of three of them: M10, yeah. M11. No, not M11. No. That's the wild duck, that's isn't it? it yeah. M10. M... I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, okay. M9, Messier 9, 10, 12, 14, 19, and 107. So if you look on your map, you'll see them all, and they're all globular clusters, and they all happen to just be in that area of Ophiuchus. And uh, with your binoculars, 10 by 50s or 7 by 50 mm. binoculars, you should be able to see the brightest two, which is M10 and M12. M14 so, I found a little if, bit hard, actually. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, yeah some of yeah. them are, because, because some of them are, although they're big, they're not bright. No. So that makes them the, the no. surface area, surface brightness uh, difficult yeah. to see. But have a look. See, see on these uh, June nights, uh, see if you can go find a couple of these things. Did you know, by the way, that the spacecraft Voyager 1 is actually heading out of the solar system now? It's been on its way since, I think, 77? Oh, yes, yes. And it's heading out of the solar system, heading in the direction of... Well, I knew, it was, I knew it was heading way out of the solar system. I, oh, that's, that's interesting. I didn't know it was heading towards... a. a a fucius. A fucius. Anyway, so we hope that uh, you'll enjoy the night sky of June. I think we're uh, about done with today. Um, don't forget to look out for those uh, aurora in the yeah. night sky. Uh, no promise, of course, uh, but the sun is becoming very active. We will reach solar maximum, as it's called, in 2025, I think. So there's a likelihood of more aurora to come. Um, you could also look in the northern sky for what we call noctilucent clouds. Yes, yes. Um, so they, what do they look like? They look like cirrus clouds low down Very, the northern horizon. Yeah, low down, but they're quite high up. They're, they're ice crystals yeah, high, high, high up in the, in the yes, yeah. that reflect the setting sun or the set sun. So have a look for those around midnight. Uh, the season is now June, July. Um, you won't confuse them with aurora. Aurora... Are, are objects that cover yeah. a great area in the sky. A, a, a good guide for them is the is the star Capella yeah. in Auriga, yeah. which is a very bright star in the north. Yeah, you know, not to be confused with the you know the North Star. Everybody thinks the North Star is the brightest star yeah. in the sky, which of course it's not. But Capella is the one. Get right. your app out, find Capella, yeah. and that's uh, in and around there is likely to be where you'll see noctilucent clouds. Yeah, so look out for those. Um, we'll be back, of course, in July with more. Uh, but if you want to learn more about astronomy uh, and you're interested, then please come and join your local astronomy clubs. Uh, we are not weird, boggle-eyed boffins. Well, uh, yeah, well, OK. Present, present, present yes. <laughs> I'm not sure whether my wife would, <laughs> would agree with that comment, but there we go. But we do love sharing our <laughs> hobby with others, and I, I think all the clubs that we're about to mention are social places to come. Yeah. Uh, you'll, you'll be most welcome. Absolutely. Uh, we're members of uh, Michael and I, and Steve Tonkin, who's normally here. We're members of Fording Bridge Astronomy. We meet on the third Wednesday of the month. Uh, at the Elm Tree in Ringwood. So that is going to be the 19th of June, our next talk. Uh, the Wessex Astronomical Society meets on the first Tuesday at the Allendale Centre in Wimborne. 
Uh, we've just missed their meeting, which is on the 4th of June, so the next one will be the 2nd of July, the first Tuesday in the month. And, of course, then we have Cranbourne Chase, a fairly new club that's formed up in Shaftesbury. And uh, we're all sisters and brothers together, and we are all the same, that we welcome new members. We look forward to sharing our delight in this hobby, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. And, and what's nice is we've had quite a few young people coming to join us. We you have. know, you know, it's not, as, as uh, Mark says, it's not for the old sandal-bearing, long-haired, uh, old, grey astronomers, you no. know, but... It's, yeah, we've got some, some, you know, we have some, some very useful people, and it's for everybody. Stargazing it's, is for everybody. It's a free resource up is. there in the sky. So, do. so come along and join us. Um, you know, like Michael and I, we started when we were eight or nine. That's a great time to start. Uh, come along and see us. Young people, most welcome. So from Mark Hardacre, wishing you all the very best. And from Michael Barrett, also. Clear skies, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Goodbye.